Chapter 7. Esper. Excerpt from the Citizens' Assembly on the Raising of Taxes on the Gridlock. Report number 3. Testimony from Randomly Selected Citizen, Mr. Ark Daniels. I contend that we should lower the tax rates on the gridlock, and on top of that, tax all the properties in the city in the same way. That's where we can get the new funding. The rich can live forever in their apartments and penthouses, but we, in the gridlock, have to constantly watch our phones, make everything always on sale. After collecting his money for forging Flora's Hope Runner application, Esper stumbled as his eyes tried to adjust to the sudden darkness of the trunks. It was thriving, just as he left it a few minutes ago. The food was still being fried. Someone was having sex in earshot. Kids were running around in oil and water. The noise rang in his ears. Anger rose from what he witnessed inside the compound. He screamed and threw a trash can down the road. He ignored the people cursing him as he stumbled away from the compound through the snaking alleyways of the trunks, through pavements, cars, and roadside buildings. Through the blur, he did not make his way to his car, but to an old corner bakery that was now someone's home. In it were the brother and sister that he was looking for. Exasperated, he knocked. Esper, yo, what's up? A young man with shoulder pads asked as he opened the door. Esper looked up from under his cap, catching his breath. I need help. An hour earlier, Esper was finishing a cocktail in the caves below the trunks. He was celebrating before collecting his reward for his job of forging a Hope Runner application. Once the people in the trunks realized that the city couldn't really surveil them down there, they tunneled deeper and developed new cave systems, some new and some branching off into abandoned tunnels. It became a hive of unruly behavior and freedom, as far away from actual life as you could get. In the caves, there was no dome and no anomaly on the horizon, only a comforting darkness. When he closed his eyes, he could imagine anything. In a cave cafe, Esper sipped his drink and nestled it neatly back down into the wet circle it had made on the bar. He tried to make sure that only one wet circle would remain, to only leave one trace. He enjoyed the cave cafes. It felt like the earth above them didn't collapse. The people walking past him told stories in their smiles, their gaits, their touches with others. He would watch and learn. On some days, he wondered whether any of them were his mother, his father, his brother, or his sister. Esper never knew them. He downed the last sweet sips of the Negroni cocktail, put it back in its wet nest, and ventured back up into the reality of the trunks. He turned his cap around and climbed the ladder back to the trunks. He knocked on the metal door above him, and with a characteristic chunking sound, a car's trunk above him popped open as the smoke and smells of liquor wafted out with him. As he climbed out into the trunks, he gave a boy standing next to the car a tip and extended a fist bump. The canary kid did what many his age did, stand next to the trunks of old cars guarding the establishments that existed below. If law enforcement came closer, in an instant, the clientele below would be notified, allowing them time to disappear into mazes of tunnels. Hey, Canary Kid, Esper said, crouching to his level. What's your name? The boy looked confused as he stared back at him with one eye that was not covered with a patch. It's okay, kid, you can trust me. My friends call me Milo. Are you an orphan? The boy nodded. How old are you? Twelve? Esper saw his own past in the boy. Here, have some extra. We orphans need to look out for each other. I'm Esper, he said, extending a money stick as a tip. The boy reached out for it, but Esper tugged his hand away into a fist and into a small jab on the boy's shoulder. Gotta be smarter here in the trunks, kid, he said, winking at him. The kid took the money stick, rubbed his shoulder, nodded, and ran off. Esper got up and started walking towards the old trunks. As Esper walked deeper into the trunks, the humidity increased and the smells became stronger. Depending on how you saw it, in this forsaken city, hope existed. It just wasn't on the horizon. The true energy came from the chambers in the trunks. Mixed with the oil that lubricated these engines, it was the smell of possibility. All the noise was a song. If you had not grown up here, it would overwhelm, an offense to the senses. 
Esper arrived at a compound with guarded, white, reflective doors. For a place deep in the trunks, it was surprisingly clean. He could almost see his reflection in it, beige all over, hands in his jacket pocket, and with a black cap looking back at him, slightly blurred. It had been years since he was inside the compound. I'm here to collect money for a job that came from Mason, Esper said as he waved the serial number of the job to the guards. They scanned it, looked at it for a short while, and let him through. Mason, the asshole that ran the compound and large territories of the trunks. Esper hated him. Collections on the right, the guard muttered. Esper nodded as he walked down a hallway towards a desk. He couldn't tell if the inside of the compound was new or old. Parts of it still looked like he remembered, but it might have been renovated. A woman was sitting at the end, peering from her glasses. I'm here to collect, Esper said, handing the slip to her. She took it and scanned it. As she did, she eyed Esper. Why are you wearing a cap down here? She asked. None of your business, Esper said as he looked around. She rolled her eyes. The compound definitely smelled the same. Cleaning equipment trying to mask trash that was somewhere in the vicinity. A beep sounded from the computer as she moved her glasses to see what was being displayed. She squinted at the computer, paused for a moment, and then squinted back at Esper. Please come with me. Esper frowned. For what? I'd just like to get my money and go. Esper heard a shuffle behind him. Two guards had appeared in the hallway. Please come with me, she said again, opening a door next to her window. You'll get your money. Come. Noticing the guards' armor and guns, Esper reluctantly agreed. The woman led him to another white door and asked the guard stationed at it. Has he been briefed? The guard replied with an affirmative and opened the door. You are free to go in. Mason wants to see you, the woman said. For what? I didn't sign up for this. I just want my money in to go. You will get your money in there, she said. Quite a predicament. He had hoped that taking the job would not involve seeing Mason again. Esper slowly stepped into an all-white room. There he was, Mason, sitting in an all-white suit behind a desk with a bodyguard behind him. Esper noticed the giant window behind the desk and the painting opposite it. The painting was a remix of Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man that was plugged into what resembled pipes leading to machines. Mason relaxed into a nonchalantly powerful position in his seat. He had what looked like a tiny tire earbud in his right ear. It startled Esper when he suddenly spoke. Isn't that painting wonderful? Man attached to his machines, forever forming part of a larger engine that is society, channeling in bursts, pushing and pulling on life around them. We think we are at liberty of our individual selves, but we are not. Esper, sit. Esper didn't notice the chair the first time, but he sat down. This is great, he said. Never had such a welcoming experience just to receive my money. Feeling very VIP right now. You'll get it. We first have some other business to discuss. Welcome back. You remember me? I remember all my children. Esper shook his head. Still treating everyone like shit? Now, now, let's not start on the wrong foot, shall we? Like I have a choice, Esper asked, gesturing his head toward the surrounding guards. Mason ignored it and continued. You forged a Hope Runner application. It's incredible. Just another day, Esper shrugged. I've been waiting for someone like you. It's a pity you left when you were younger. So smart. I have another job for you. If you can forge a Hope Runner application, this would be easy. Nope, I want my 10 grand and I'll be gone. Mason ignored him. Here's what I want you to do. Here's the challenge. If you can manipulate any part of the public car markets for our benefit, I'll give you 100000 The thought of 100000 made gears turn in Esper's mind. For a moment, he considered it, but he remembered who he's dealing with. No, I want my money and then I'll be gone. Mason stood and gestured to Esper to come look through the window behind his desk. As he walked closer, an enormous cavern came into view. When Esper realized what he would stare down at, he froze. As a kid, he used to stare up at this window, wondering who was keeping them all locked up. Esper shuffled closer. 
It had what seemed like trees, buildings, and walkways throughout it. At the back were large white mechs, empty like statues looking down into it. Young kids were running around in it. They looked happy. You might remember what this looked like when you were young. It was when we started it, Mason said. Esper's mind blew off more dust in some unkempt dark recesses of his mind. In case you forgot, Mason continued, this is a compound for orphans. It's an old storm drain. I know, how could I forget? They are in cages down here. I was in them. No. It all came back to him. Mason looked after the kids in the trunks, orphans or not. He gave them safe places to play, learn, and live. However, he had one ultimatum when they turned 18. Join and work with him, or forever be ostracized from his support networks. In some instances, the threat even extended to murder. He's killed people for not joining him. Esper, an orphan, found the early stages of the compound claustrophobic. He ran away before Mason could present him the ultimatum. So you're saying that you aren't willing to help at all? We need all the help we can get. You heard about the Parliament starting the sessions on raising the tax rates on the gridlock? It's all a ruse. It's the Emmer family that have the city in their palms. They waited, just waited for this opportune moment to raise the tax rates again. And now the Parliament has their excuse to fund more of the awful Hope Runner championships. If they win at convincing the public that Trunks is over... It will not only stop growing, but it will shrink. A higher tax rate will undo everything we are working for. No one will want to invest in building new structures above their cars if it can be more readily bought away from them. They will take away the life of these kids. You see them? If we weren't here, they would all die. Now, they need us. More than ever. Mason turned towards Esper. You are saying that it doesn't matter if they die? Mason nodded a request to his henchman. The man went to the door and retrieved a boy. Esper's stomach bunched into a knot. It was Milo, the boy that guarded the cave cafe. Mason walked back around the desk to the boy. You just became friends, didn't you? Milo here is a canary kid and a long-time orphan here with us. He rested one arm on the boy's shoulders and the other on a knife that was dangling from his belt. Is he implying that he would hurt the boy? What had happened to Milo's eye? The thought sent shivers down Esper's spine. He knew that Mason hurt adults, but did he also hurt and intimidate the kids? Despicable. Esper looked down with his cap protecting him from the scene. He wanted to leave, to run away like he did in his youth. But for a moment, he wondered whether Milo could be his brother. I'll do it. Stop. Stop. He gathered some courage and looked at Milo and Mason. For a million If I can manipulate the public car markets, you'll stand to make a lot more than that. Mason smiled. I like you. Mason paused for a moment and took his hand off his knife. Deal. If you can manipulate the public car markets without being noticed, you'll get your million. Mason nodded to his henchmen and he moved Milo back out of sight. Will the boy be okay? Esper, Esper, Esper. The trunks are a family. You know that. We take care of each other. The real enemy is the families up there living in the penthouses. Our brother will not just be okay. He will thrive with our help. The door opened back into the hallway. Esper stood there for a moment, feeling his head boil under his cap. He was short of breath, wanting to rail back at Mason for what he did to him when he was a boy, keeping him captured in this stark white hellhole. He calmed himself, and without a word, Esper walked out towards the collections desk. The woman was waiting for him to give him his reward. He collected it and received the new bounty slip for the new job. He stumbled onwards, not paying much attention to the woman. He needed help. Through the blur of the trunks, he made his way to the old corner bakery. It used to see sunshine and fresh bread in the mornings, but today, the only light that shone into it was from the hanging lights above the cars. He knocked. Esper, yo, what's up? A young man with shoulder pads asked as he opened the door. Esper looked up under his cap. He caught his breath. I need help. Rulo, Saga, please. I need help. Rulo let Esper in as he straightened his wavy hair with his headband. 
Saga, with her short, shaved hair and round glasses, came around the corner from her makeshift room in the kitchen. Esper, what's going on? They sat at one of the tables in the bakery that once held clientele. Esper gathered himself. I have a job. Yes? Saga answered with a curious look. It's for a million, Esper said. Both Saga and Rulo almost fell off their chairs. Who pays that money, Mason? Saga asked. Esper said nothing. It is Mason? No, Esper. Sis, that is not... Rulo rumbled. Rulo! Saga said as she interrupted her brother. She stared at him. This might be what we need. Hear him out. Saga turned back to Esper. How? Esper cleared his throat. I got the job from Mason himself. He posted a job a while back that Palma found. Rulo and Saga nodded. This job was to forge a Hope Runner application, and he gave it to me, knowing that Flora wanted to be a Hope Runner, and I thought, you know what? This should be impossible. Let's try. I did it. It worked, and now Flora is a Hope Runner candidate. Holy shit, you entered her? Rulo asked. Yes. How? Why? Is she still going to be a candidate? Rulo asked. She ran out when we watched the announcement, and she has said nothing since. She was furious. I I don't know. I take it she is doing it or considering it. Otherwise, she would have publicly denounced her candidacy by now. She refuses to talk to me. You know her. She's always wanted this, and it was an interesting challenge that paid well. As to how, the hardest part to forge is the biometric signature. That's hard or nearly impossible to forge. But a very simple error in their system is that the validation check against the city's database didn't verify whether the request succeeded. So all I needed to do was send a simple denial of service attack during the self-check itself, timing out the request. It sent back an error, but the software just interpreted it as a success. If the validation request worked but failed, it would return invalid, but anything else was interpreted as valid. Rulo looked confused. It doesn't matter that much. It worked, and I went to collect my money. It turns out he posted that job to find people to do something more extreme. I negotiated a higher payment, and Esper, what's the job? Saga asked. We have to find a way to manipulate the public car markets in his favor without anyone noticing. Rulo sank as Saga cracked a massive grin. She turned to her brother with a look of seeking permission. This is it. This is perfect. This is what we've been waiting for. This is the money we need. No, for what? Maybe getting caught? You just want to get out, don't you? Get that penthouse's apartment and snob up to the people there? Do you need me anyway? Rulo, you are the one that's not providing your fair share. The reason we are in this position is because you aren't coaching anymore after your accident. And yes, at some point, we need to move on. Esper interjected. We need you. Your contacts will be useful and you know hardware. Rulo looked up at Esper and Saga. What guarantees do we have that Mason will leave us alone after this job? that he won't just kill us, given that we also then know how to rob the public car markets. Isn't that a problem? There is no guarantee, Esper answered. But it's one million. Rulo threw his hands into the air and paced around the room. Saga added more color. Please, this is life-changing money. It's worth the risk. What's the alternative? Also, imagine you could finally get that big cave you dreamed of in the trunks. And maybe even open up that pet shelter. You couldn't save Paquilo, but there are a lot of dogs in the trunks that would love a home. Rulo was deep in thought, his face contorting alongside anxious breathing. His hands trembled over his face as he closed his eyes. Whatever was going on, he seemed to be fighting a memory he didn't enjoy recalling. Rulo snapped out of it. You do realize what you're doing. Gaslighting me with trauma from my dog to get me to potentially land in jail again or get killed. Esper, why didn't you just say no? You've talked shit so much about Mason over the years, how he treated you as a kid. Seems you have a price. Like you wouldn't pay anything to get your dog back. 
Esper replied. He wondered whether to share what happened in Mason's compound. Look, he started taking a breath. He threatened a kid with a knife in front of me. That's why I had to say yes. So I made a good thing out of an unpleasant situation. If we can make this work, Mason will give us a million credits and he threatened a kid. See, that's exactly why we shouldn't work with him. Sis, look, oh my word, Rulo said. She didn't reply. So Rulo turned back to Esper. You knew this might happen when you took the original job to enter Flora, so you were left with a choice of having Mason hurt someone or you must work for him. Now we're being roped in. The three friends sat together in silence. Saga looked around the bakery before she spoke. What's the alternative? We walk away from this job? You aren't going to coach again. You said that yourself. If you don't want to work on it, then Esper and I will, she said, looking to Esper and turning her back on Rulo. Esper saw Rulo's eyes in the sudden fear. He realized what game Saga was playing. Rulo was attached to his sister. He would not like to be excluded. Esper spoke to Saga, pulling Rulo a bit further away. It would be tougher, but we should be okay. However, we'll then need a separate space away from the bakery to ensure we can focus properly. Where do you... Okay, fine, I'll help, I'll help. You need me, I'm sure of it. Rulo blurted out, moving closer to the table and sitting down again. Despite the little game that Saga played, a genuine smile crept across her face. She got up and hugged her brother. He held her arms that were wrapped around him. It confused Esper. He never had such a bond. He thought of Milo. A brother? He shrugged it off. Okay, we'll start soon. He said as he got up and rushed back to his car. In his wake, to simply help, a chain reaction had started. Not just in the trunks, but also in the penthouses.